were the two teachers. Where school is always in session. Today we're looking at the granddaddy of them all, where we the people rule the United States Congress. Whoo, Andy. By cameralism, right from the start, we learn a lot about what our founders thought and what we still think today. Well, and it's so interesting with how bicameralism relates to coronavirus and policies that our federal government's trying to pass in emergency situations. Of course, our founders were suspicious of concentrating power in any one place too much. And so they divided up our legislative branch into two chambers by cameralism with the House uh, having representing more of the larger states with more members in the House versus that equal representation in the Senate. But you can't pass a law still today without both of those chambers approving that legislation through bicameralism. And it's hard sometimes. Well, clearly inefficiency is written into the code. The Constitution didn't envision policies passing quickly. Here we are in an emergency needing quick policies, and the Congress barely can even be in session because the rules are somewhat arcane. But Andy, uh, students are asking me, Mr. Larson, how can we just how come we just can't wave a wand and get things done? And we're learning about enumerated powers. We still have a limited government. And those key, that key enumerated power is the power of Congress to regulate commerce or interstate trade uh, between states. Because we know from almost the very beginning of our constitutional republic that commerce clause has been interpreted pretty flexibly that has given our national legislature, our national government, power to regulate almost everything that's deemed to be economic activity, which is a lot. And so that's really, really where you've seen the powers of the national government grow is because specifically that enumerated power to regulate commerce. Well, we know our Congress has the authority to write laws. Much of those laws deal with money. We talk about Congress's power of the purse. They control the money, and boy, are they spending a lot right now. But Andy, my students are still confused about this necessary and proper clause. Does that mean Congress can write laws about anything they want? No, no. Remember that the elastic clause, or what we sometimes call implied powers, uh, comes from the necessary and proper clause only if the necessary and proper clause is connected to those expressed and enumerated powers above it in Article 1, Section 8. And so that's, again, where the Commerce Clause is so important because the Constitution says that Congress can regulate trade between states, but then there's this added flexibility of the Necessary and Proper Clause that gives flexibility for Congress to pass, particularly in a, a, an economic crisis like now, a whole range of different economic policies uh, with, with an incredible amount of flexibility because of the way the Constitution was written in 1787. Well, we know that the policymaking process is different in both chambers, not necessarily constitutionally, but just the protocols, in part because of the size of each chamber, the House so large, so potentially unruly, the Rules Committee really plays a significant role in how the House operates, how revenue bills start there and so on. And Andy, then in the Senate, you've got that strange protocol, that filibuster that to a large extent explains how our Senate works and why our Congress doesn't. Right, and it's remarkable that with these rules that you're talking about, each of the chambers still operates in very similar ways over two centuries. And we know specifically that the majority party that controls the House of Representatives gets most of their policies through because the rules of the House with limited debate, with limited opportunity to amend legislation on the floor during debate really is geared towards the majority party getting their policies passed. Whereas the Senate has always been that, what we call that cooling chamber, or when we use the metaphor of the cup and the saucer, the house is hot, the cup, and it passes policies quickly, preferred by the majority, but then it gets to the Senate. The Senate tends to have much longer debates, 
potential for a filibuster by a minority side in the Senate to slow that legislative debate down, potential for what we call open rules in the Senate floor where individual senators can offer amendments to slow the process down, to cool that legislative process down in the U.S. Senate. Well, we're learning about the leadership too, Andy, and so much about policymaking is agenda setting. President Trump is saying do this and do that, but Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, the Democrats hold the majority. The Democrats certainly don't want to just say, Trump, you can get whatever you want. We're learning about how political parties still play a role in our Congress, and we're, we're, we're learning about how important that leadership is. Trump the other day asked, asked for something. Uh, he wanted to suspend Congress. He wanted to uh, close the chamber down so he could get access to more of his appointments. And even his own majority leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell said, whoa, 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 this isn't the time to uh, shutter up Congress. Well, again, we have that moment now that you alluded to of divided government, where the House is controlled by the Democratic Party, which tends to be in opposition to the Senate, which is controlled by the majority party and, and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. And of course, the, the White the executive branch, was, which is controlled by the Republican Party, and it really leads to some interesting votes that members of Congress, both in the House and the Senate, take in how they, the, the reasons why they vote. Uh, we know that there's that trustee model for members of Congress who kind of trust their own gut instinct and kind of vote their personal preference. And we know that sometimes there's that delegate model where a member of Congress is going to vote based on the preferred wishes of their voters, their constituents back in their home state or the home district. And then we have that partisan model where that member of Congress, which is really, really common, where that member of Congress is voting yes or no on legislation based on how their party uh, votes. That's the partisan model. Of course, you can combine all of those models of voting with what is sometimes called the Politico model which combines all those models of legislative voting. Andy, we've covered Congress, but there's still the pink elephant in the room, and dare I say it, gerrymandering. Gerrymandering that process where state legislatures, in most states, convene every 10 years after the census, and because of reapportionment rules, have to redistrict, have to redraw the congressional district lines in each state, and all too often they draw those lines to advantage one party over another, to the point where this political skullduggery appears as if the politicians choose us rather than us choosing them. The courts have played a role in this, and maybe we need to unpack just a little bit Baker v. Carr and Shaw v. Reno, because frankly, gerrymandering can cause a lot of headaches. Well, really, you're talking about legislative redistricting that really only affects the House representatives or those legislative districts in the individual states. And you're absolutely right that every 10 years, the Constitution says we can reapportion districts, reapportion states to see how many representatives is California going to get this year. How many will Illinois or New York or Florida get? That's called reapportionment. And we have a Supreme Court case about reapportionment called Baker v. Carr, which essentially says the Supreme Court ruled in the 1960s that every legislative district in a state has to have equal populations. And this really was a civil rights case to make sure that the voting power of racial and ethnic minorities was not diluted with what's called malapportionment. And, and again, that's the fancy explanation. The easy explanation is one man, one vote, that every legislative district, because of Baker v. Carr, has to be reapportioned with equal populations in each of the districts within that state. Well, that independent judiciary got involved in the political thicket in Baker v. Carr, and we've been battling gerrymandering ever since, to the point now where we're looking at certain racially gerrymandered districts, and the courts have come in and Shaw v. Reno and said, listen, we really don't like using race as a factor in determining redistricting lines, but it happens. Well, again, the House is much more diverse and, and more reflective of the racial and uh, ethnic diversity of the United States 
And it's partly because of cases like Baker v. Carr and cases like Reno versus Shaw, Shaw versus Reno, in which, yes, the court has said that when we interpret the Voting Rights Act of 1965, you can use race and ethnicity as a factor in drawing these legislative boundaries, particularly in a metropolitan area, but it can't be the only factor. And, and those decisions have allowed for, yes, there are some limits on how you draw those lines, uh, but those lines can be drawn in a way to boost ethnic and racial diversity in the House of Representatives. Andy, in this time of crisis, we want Congress to save us, but the rules and protocols and traditions of Congress make it really hard because the policymaking process is so inefficient. Huh. We're frustrated, but our founders have never been happier. We're the two teachers. No fancy words. No fancy suits. Plain talk about issues you need to know. Just in time. <laughs>